Okay. So, good afternoon to one and all, and good evening to my uh, um, my colleague and friend, <laughs> Sam, Dr. Sam, because it's evening today, late evening today. So, uh, at the outset, let me thank Dr. Dana Radler for having invited me to give a lecture on eternal values and their uh, relevance to higher education. And uh, I am deeply impressed by the way uh, His Excellency um, from the embassy has written on value-based education. Perhaps it itself is a lecture on eternal values uh, and their relevance to higher education. He has written very elaborately the uh, problems and the solutions and all that. So it was a real feast to my ears and um, it gave me a vision of the world devoid of wisdom. So, um, in, now, as the topic goes, eternal values and their relevance to higher education, before, let us uh, try to know what is education actually today? What is happening to the education system? Education, is education just a mere acquisition of knowledge? or how many kinds of knowledge are there? If so, what are they? What is its nature, etc.? And then, what are the values we are talking about in uh, when we say eternal values or value-based education, as the Excellency has cited it? What are these values? How many kinds of values are there? Let's look into these things. So, when we look into, and overall, is there a necessity to discuss values in education? What makes us to think and rethink and rethink about values in education? Is there a dire necessity to discuss values in education or is it just a random search for mere desire to fulfill, uh, you know, uh, some researcher and is it suffice let us look at Amartya Sen, uh, the Nobel Prize winner for economics, and John Kenneth Galbraith, an American economist. What do they say about this? Education makes us the human beings we are. It has major impacts on economic development, on social equity, gender equity. In all kinds of ways, our lives are transformed by education and security. Even if it had not one iota of effect of security, it would still remain, in my judgment, the biggest priority in the world. Imparting education not only enlightens the receiver, but also broadens the giver, the teachers, the parents, the friends. And John Kenneth Galbraith, a well-known American economist, who the author of Affluent Society, dealing with American society, raises questions of values. Amartya Sen says the biggest priority in the world is education and Galbraith says for the need of values. Let us look into the present and near history for the causes of the emphasis on education and values. The threat of the nuclear war and the complete destruction of human life, a merry-go-round we are having all the time, but we have no time to think on these fundamental issues, that is, eternal values. Among values, there are some which are temporarily changing but time-bound, but there are values which are eternal. We do not know that subject in the modern cultural context. We assume for ourselves that nothing is eternal and everything is temporary and time bound. This is the approach attitude we have today. This attitude has become very prominent today. The rejection of all values and the life for the moment, that is the idea prevailing today. We have developed an attitude of doing everything what each one likes, devoid of what happens to the nation, society, family, the globe, 
and the universe as a whole. This puts the distant mission for our sight to the backstage. History has taught us that humans uh, decay. Sorry for the interruption. Excuse me. Are you moving your slides? Yeah, I think your slides are not moving. So could you yeah, please yeah, take yeah. care of that? Thank yeah, you. Yeah. For example, the Roman civilization, when we look into the uh, what Amartya Sen and Nobel, uh, the Nobel Prize winner for economics, Max and Galbraith talks about economics is is economics just confined to earning money. So let's look into this. What history says. The Roman civilization, such a powerful civilization that had so, done so much good to humanity at one time, but this has disappeared today. Why? Due to his hedonistic pleasures, which meant too much of sensual self-indulgence. Due to this, they did not work and brought soldiers and mercenaries. The amphitheaters in Rome remind you that Man and man fight animals, so much of killing and violence. When we look into the invasions and start thinking deeply, what has happened to this wonderful phenomenon called man? What tremendous capabilities are there in man? What wonderful dimensions are in him? All are eliminated, all are ignored, only one level of life remains. That is the hedonistic, that is the sensual pleasure seeking and satisfaction, that is the death of the civilization, as there were enemies within themselves. So we, we find that because there were enemies within themselves itself, many of the civilizations have come to deal. This is what history teaches us. Many civilizations have become extinct. So today, we see the advancement of science and technology taking us to a level where man is scared of his own inventions. The creation becomes a death to the creator himself. In the process of fulfilling our cravings, we are going on multiplying and multiplying and started using technology as a tool. And today we are scared that it may replace the entire human race. Galbraith calls economics as dismal science. To quote, economics is a dismal, a dismal science dealing with only profit and loss, or rather sell, deal, and purchase cheap. That's meaning of economics, he says. Is this the only value, money, and hedonistic pleasures? We are today so conditioned that we think earning money and to fulfill the sensual pleasures is a goal of life. Has it no other dimensions? Science has not touched this on values and ethics, not answered the human complexities. And let's look at what uh, Bertrand Russell talks about, Bertrand Russell says, Understanding of human nature must be the basis of any real improvements in human life. Science da has done wonders in mastering the laws of the physical world, but our own nature is much less understood as yet than the nature of stars and electrons. When science learns to understand human nature, it will be able to bring a happiness into our lives, which machines and the physical science have failed to create. And this Huxley says, further, sorry, further Bertrand Russell says, machines are worshipped because they are beautiful and valued because they confer power. They are hated because they are hideous and loathed because they impose slavery. So today, in the world of science and technology, we are, our own creation is a threat to our own self. 
So there is a trust in the whole world, the debate between technology and humanity. And we fear that previously it was the nationalistic conflicts, societal conflicts, individual conflicts, and various other external conflicts. Today, science has taken us to a different pedestal altogether. And today, we are fighting with our own creation. And we are scared that technology may replace the humanity. AI, artificial intelligence, that's how man has coined the term artificial intelligence. His own intelligence, he doesn't want to say that that is original. He wants to again claim that mine is original and the one that he himself invented. Can we say that our child is a duplicate or artificial? But see how we are, I mean, how man is. We always want to credit our own self. When we come... When we compare our, ourselves, the human race, with the other living organisms, man has become so selfish in this world that we always try to claim superior and we say that, you know, that's how a famous, uh, you know, philosopher from the, you know, from India, uh, Adi Shankaracharya says, Jantu naam narajanma durlaba mataha. Jantu naam, of all the animals, of all the living organisms, it is narajanma, that is the birth of human, of a human being is very precious. So we should be very proud of our human existence itself. Why? Because mind is present in us. We start thinking. Whereas animals and the plants do not have that privilege. So having been born as a human being, we are bent upon feeling very superior to the other living organisms. And today we are bent upon, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, what to say, we are bent upon uh, creating havoc to the whole human race not only the human race, but the entire universe itself. Not even giving space to the other living organisms. Right from the macro to the micro level. And the consequences we find in nature. The one is the immediate corona that we had embraced. And still we are struggling with it. The small microorganism, if it gets into our system, it can distort the whole world, the whole universe itself. And today we claim ourselves human beings. We are the, you know, the all the superlative uh, terms uh, we attribute to ourselves. A small, unperceived, a subtle organism has the power to distort the whole human race. Then who are we? What are we? Even the elephant, the biggest, uh, uh, you know, in size, the largest in size, Huh? In the animal kingdom itself, a small mosquito or an ant gets into its trunk, then it's it's gone. Then what are we claiming at? What do we really want? Let us see what the other uh, thinkers and prominent uh, personalities have been talking about this. To a world at war, a world that, because it lacks the intellectual and spiritual prerequisites to peace, can only hope to patch up some kind of precarious armed truce. It stands pointing clearly and unmistakably to the one, to the only road of escape from the self-imposed necessity and self-destruction. If philosophy is for anything, if it is not a kind of mumbling in the dark, a form of busy work, it must shed some light upon path. Life without it must be a different sort of thing from life with it. And the difference which it makes must be in us. Philosophy then is reflection upon social ideals and education is the effort to actualize those in ideals in human behavior, says Dewey. An education to philosophy is at one and the same time an expression of what someone or some school of thought regards as a central so social ideals to be approached 
through organized education and an indication of the means most conducive to the gaining of such ends. Now, in the name of education, what are we doing? Why still so many, every year, every uh, second, every minute, there are many educational, see, every street has an educational institution nowadays. And we claim that we want to be the, you know, um, uh, the supreme of all the creations in the world. But today, in the name of education, what is happening? Why are we not still happy? We are reaching the moon. We have reached the moon. We have reached the uh, various planets. Our attempts are going on and on and on and on. We want to encroach the whole human race. And we call this as education. So is it mere just an acquisition of knowledge today in the colleges in the name of higher institutions? Sometimes students do not attend the classes. They say, oh man, Google is there for me. Google teacher is there, I'll browse the Google. Google. But a teacher in person and a Google in virtual, how does it help us? That's how today in the name of education, it is also, uh, we have also come to a stage where teacher versus uh, technology versus teaching education. Now, AI is going to take the teacher's role. So what will be the education? And still, why are we, what is the dire necessity for us to talk about uh, values in um, education? So the limitations of science we have seen till date, limitations of science, science looking always for facts and evidences, the subtle feelings of the human race, the values that the human race has, that has, science has not touched upon. So today, in the name of, uh, in the name of education, we are just trying to earn a livelihood. And what is happening today is, uh, uh, again, Technology is going to overcome even the job process. So in this scenario, what is going to happen? What was education, how it is? Western philosophies of management have always been the benchmark for corporate houses across the world with growing global economic crisis, corporate wars and failed joint venture and overall the market crash from time to time triggered by socio-economic and political factors has compelled researchers and management practitioners to look towards oriental cultures. Today's education is touching the brain but cannot influence the soul, the inner self of an individual which is left unidentified because of which the individual is becoming emotionless, valueless, moralless. So in this kind of a scenario, why is there still a necessity of discussing the value-based education system, the values? Are we happy in this educational setup? Because today, today's education is equated only to satisfy the hedonistic pleasures. And to satisfy the hedonistic pleasures, we have defined time as money. In the management institutions, we teach the children stating that time, time means money. You should not waste the time. So we are equating time to money and we are, we, we are the only goal in our life is to fulfill the hedonistic pleasures. So we have conditioned our minds to such an extent that if the hedonistic pleasures are fulfilled, then that is the goal of life. But these hedonistic pleasures, unfortunately, doesn't have a full stop. One after the other, one after the other, the desires creep up, creep up and creep up. So that's why we are not happy. So what then is, so these kind of values, today's value, as I said, it is 
what i feel i will do it is an impulse and relay, release impulse i felt and i did it and in the name of right to expression right to certain things right to education right to freedom right to that we misuse certain things and today we term that as values just to fulfill the transient pleasures because these values are transient in its nature we find only transient happiness so then is there something called values that are eternal in its nature if so what it is so the transient pleasures to fulfill the transient pleasures whatever values has been inbuilt in that inculcated into that embedded in that because the knowledge that is being imparted in the educational institutions caters only to the need of uh, to eat one's livelihood and hedon hedonistic pleasures and it's transient in nature it does not give complete happiness so thus there is still lack of happiness in the human race is there something called eternal so let's see what does scientists tell as far as the laws of mathematics refer to reality they are not certain and as far as they are certain they do not refer to reality says albert einstein max planck says all matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force we must assume behind this force the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind the mind is the matrix of all matter further einstein says when i read the bhagavad gita and reflect about how god created this universe everything else seems so superficial superfluous hans peter der says whenever i give a lecture on quantum physics i feel as if i am talking on vedanta so vedanta is a spiritual indian text and as well as bhagavad gita is also considered as the um, you know uh, fifth um, uh, veda as well as uh, one of the upanishads what does this talk about why is the human race still uh, not happy as i told you because education is imparting in the name of education knowledge that is finite is being imparted today so the eternal value, so even today's youngsters the youth feels is there something called eternal can it be is it superficial if someone says no it cannot be how can something be eternal in this world so that's where the philosophers of india that is the indian seers have come into uh, you know the real picture where the indian philosophy talks about knowledge that is infinite in its nature is true education to quote in sanskrit it says sa vidya ya vimuktaye it is that knowledge that liberates which knowledge the knowledge of the eternal now what is this eternal who is eternal here is there any object that is eternal or are we eternal how does it go so the 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 knowledge of the infinite says for example i am reminded here about tennyson's poem the brook it says men may come and men may go but i remain forever birth and death these are you know one after the other it happens but the enquiry within us where are we going to where are we coming to where do we go and where we do do we come from the enquiry of the self when we try to know the enquiry of self within we the 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 enquiry into the self 
is a solution for the obliteration of all the conflicts within and without. So today's education, unfortunately, is driven only to impart a finite knowledge. So that's why we aren't happy. So there is a dire need for us to revamp the, the present education system and then travel towards a universalistic value that is internal in its nature, that is the inner self. So inner self, the knowledge of the spirit, who are we, what are we? We say that a person is dead. Then what is the missing element in him that is gone that we say he is dead? The life force within us. Can any doctor give us life? He only can impart the medical knowledge and apply the medical techniques on the patient. Can he give life? So this is how the Western philosophers have come to India to know what is happening. Is there something called the eternal self? Is there something called the, uh, you know, uh, when we are the richest, the affluent society, a great economist has written the, um, a book on titled The Affluent Society, where he says values that we talk about, if, if it caters only to earning money and fulfilling the hedonistic pleasures, then where are we? Are? Why are we not happy? And in the name of hedonistic pleasures, we have created technology and still going on and on and on and on. So the Indian sages have looked into this uh, knowledge that is the knowledge of the eternal and that is the self-knowledge. In Sanskrit, it is called Atma Vidya. Atma means self. Adhyatma Vidya. The origin of the self. So there is a conflict within us should I speak? Should I not speak? Should I have some water? Should I not have some water? Should I go to the college? Should... So every second, every minute, the mind is analyzing. So we are not able to control the mind towards right and wrong. Is there something called right and wrong? The mind is a monkey, says Swami Vivekananda. The mind always keeps on swaying and swaying and swaying. If we can control over the mind and transcend and look into within what's happening. And from within, if we can look into without. So today, unfortunately, the knowledge that is imparted is knowledge outside in. The external knowledge, we are taking it in. When I see the flower, I feel like keep it, you know. Uh, I don't admire it. I don't adore it. Instead, a scientist tries to dissect it, go on dissecting it and try to look into it. But if at all, we try to look at the beauty of the flower and try to think who the creator would be. If this flower is so beautiful, who the creator would be? Who is this? What is the connection between me and the flower? Me and the whole universe? So the knowledge that says, I am you, I am you. Today's knowledge, again, this I am you is very dangerous. If there is an I, then there is a you. The word in English, that is empathy. Stepping in through the shoes of others. We are all in the teaching community and students. Some student is coming and telling us, Tomorrow, I won't be able to come. Someone has passed away today in my family, so I have attended to the rituals. So if we say, I don't know, you are supposed to come. That's the rule of the institution. So if we could look from, we are just looking from our angle and the rules and regulations of the institution. If we could look that in case if that happened to me, 
So today it is always the sympathy is different and empathy is different. So being very empathetic, I am you. So the whole world, when we look from within, we tend to look at the whole world from our own. You feel that you are everywhere in the whole universe. You are all pervasive. I am all pervasive. I am in everything. Then we don't try to inflict pain or havoc to the entire human race. At the, the speck, the, every drop in the ocean thinks it is because of the me the ocean exists. And the ocean thinks in the same way. But every speck, everything, everything contributes to this. So we are all a small speck in the whole universe called ocean. Every drop has all the attributes that the ocean contains. So the, all the living organisms have all the universalistic attributes that the universe, entire universe exists. So that is what is wisdom, the sense of discrimination, if I am me. So the ancient sages says, look from within, don't look from without, 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 don't look from outside, externally don't look. Look into, into yourself, you will understand who you are and then look from that um, you know, that feeling, that experience that says, I am the eternal, I am the all pervasive. If the body exists, the mind also exists. If the body perishes, the mind also perishes. So unfortunately, today's knowledge is all bound with mind that only analyzes. But if we look into within, we will know the answer. If today I am dead, the universe doesn't stop. If today, tomorrow you are dead, everything in the nations have perished. Societies have perished. Everything has perished. But has the universe stopped? No. Yeah. So there is some eternal force. So the knowledge that imparts that eternal force nature is eternal in its nature. And we need to teach that kind of a value-based system in our education. So unfortunately, today's education in the name of science and technology or whatnot, it does not cater to the needs. It does not transcend the mind. Only if we transcend the mind and look within, we can understand. Because mind always tempts. It always analyzes. It doesn't synthesize. But when I look within, no matter, all those who are in this platform are in different places. But when the thought is, when we are all one together, we are all thinking in the same plane. There is one end. If there is a birthday, then there is a death day. Something that is begun is sure to end. That is transient in its nature. So the body is transient in its nature. I am this body you call Dr. Ruk Rukmini and then Dr. Rukmini and then Dr. Rukmini was introduced today. In the platform, all are from the education platform. All are educationists. Again, if we go and go and go, all the feelings are the same. You are from Romania. I am from this territory. I am from this territory. I am black. I am white. I am this. I am that. When we look from within, these are all transient in nature. What has our existence's identities to do with all these things? So something that the knowledge that transcends these kind of evidential facts, which the science is trying to look at it with, with facts and evidences, today we are imparting that. So that's why the whole have it. Now, where do we get this kind of a self-knowledge? As I told you, the Indian saints who were researchers had looked into this issue and have inquired into the self. 
and the one who obliterates the darkness in us is called a guru in sanskrit the darkness prevailing today we are in the entire darkness there is no happiness at all we do not know why and in the name of education we are just trying to eke out our livelihood and their hedonistic pleasures transient in this nature so we need to go to a a, a person who who knows this kind of self knowledge and so that's why he is given a, a place next to god is equal to god that's why in sanskrit we say guru the person who obliterates the darkness within us is the creator the destroyer and the operator brahma vishnu and maheshwara he teaches us that everything is one in its nature advaita dvaita means dual today lot of research is happening in the literature departments talking about bio, binary oppositions the more and more we look into these binaries i you my mine yours nation territory my community your community my institution your institution then we are gone <clears throat> there will be only a comma because we find more and more differences more and more differences more and more differences but the hand that shows it is you there are three more finger the finger that shows it is you there are more fingers to show that we, you know you i <clears throat> so it is the knowledge the inquiry of within that gives that is eternal in its nature so it is this knowledge so that's how eternal values <clears throat> to higher education this kind of values if it is imparted then the whole universe will be a beautiful place within <clears throat> so man is god the indian philosophy says man can become god if he transcends the mind that analyzes there is nothing called there is no separate god <clears throat> here true knowledge as i told you true knowledge the eternal knowledge is the true and truth is only one as i told you it is one in many and many in one the same life force is in the form of a flower the same life force is in the form of a microorganism the same life force is in the form of all of us so the knowledge of that one life force that is identical in its that is showing in various identical diverse forms that knowledge is true true knowledge truth is one but the wise got name it in many ways you may call we may call you know i am rukmini is somebody is something something but we are all one the undercurrent when we look into the undercurrent everything is one true knowledge is a perception concerning everything of whatever kind that the thing is the true thing every object whatever may be its nature can confer wisdom if one is able to recognize the true and lasting values from that nature of the particular object so this is what i could tell you before i conclude i would like to tell that today with a humble effort effort we need to put our hands together and then try our best to in part this kind of an education to the entire human race we would be a drop in the ocean called the eternal uh, or say eternity eternal knowledge eternal education whatever again we should not be 
uh, uh, what to say, um, caught up with words. Words are very, names, sorry. Names are very dangerous. Again, you know, there are other diversities in nature that we ponder and look into that. So that is what I could say. To conclude, today there is a dire necessity to save this human race from the so-called knowledge that caters to the transient pleasures. We need to save our own self. So there is a dire need to revive the education system. Slowly, we need to, uh, what's it, the shift, the pa there should be a paradigm shift. That I, I can use this word paradigm because we need to take a U-turn. We have completely, uh, you know, been uh, distancing from the eternity and the eternal knowledge. So we need to take a paradigm shift and once again revive the restored glory that once upon a time existed in the human race. Thank you for your patience uh, listening. Thank you one and all.